Having used Hassan's essay to prefigure some of the main threads of what is arising beyond postmodernism, and having furthermore attempted some of my own preliminary theories accounting for such threads, I would like now to turn to the heart of the matter and finally get to exploring some of the post-postmodernisms that have been proposed by theorists and artists since the turn of the millennium. Remodernism, performatism, and metamodernism. After we tour these models of the post-postmodern, I'd like to again attempt some synthesis to see how these different articulations relate, what they have in common, and to argue, as I did with Leotard, Harvey, and Jameson, how they might all be seen as diverse refractions of the same cultural wavelength. I begin with Remodernism, a label put forward by British artists Billy Childish and Charles Thompson all the way back in the year 2000. Childish and Thompson were responding even then to the canonization and institutionalization of the postmodern avant-garde, which was more or less complete by the late 1990s. As they saw it, the confluence of the capitalist establishment and the postmodern aesthetic was nowhere better on display than at the prestigious Tate Gallery in London, where postmodern trends dominated under the directorship of Nicholas Sirota, and which increasingly found itself patronized by big business sponsors. In response to this situation, Childish and Thompson called for a revival of more modernist principles and practices which they saw as more honest, hardy, and inclusive. With a nod to the modernist penchant for drawing up manifestos and naming new movements, they called themselves Stuckists and articulated remodernism, declaring, Through the course of the 20th century, modernism has progressively lost its way, until finally toppling into the pit of postmodern balderdash. At this appropriate time, the Stuckists the first remodernist art group announced the birth of remodernism. The full manifesto is linked in the description. One notes immediately in it the perceived loss of transcendent categories in cultural production and the desire for their return. The manifesto's epigraph, Towards a New Spirituality in Art, makes this explicit, and its dissatisfaction with the unidimensional plane of pure immanence is heard in its call for a new period, one that, quote, embodies a spiritual depth and meaning and brings to an end an age of scientific materialism, nihilism, and spiritual bankruptcy. For Hassan, this desire for spirit is rooted largely in the ethical realm in an attempt to bridge the solipsistic gaps opened by postmodern fragmentation and factionalization. So too is the aspiring remodernists write, Why do we need a new spirituality in art? Because connecting in a meaningful way is what makes people happy. Being understood and understanding each other makes life enjoyable and worth living. To an art world steeped in the hermeneutics of suspicion, Dedicated to subversion, disruption, deconstruction, and problematizing, such words may sound ridiculously banal, naive, boring, platitudinous. And yet, read in the light of Wallace's critique of postmodernism, they might also seem subversive, even radical. An expression of a new sensibility whose rebels, as Wallace put it, Quote, have the childish gall actually to endorse and instantiate single entendre principles. Finally, it is also clear that the spirit of this new spirituality here aspired to is not simply the old traditional notion. We recall Hassan's similar disclaimer that a new post postmodern spirit must not be merely a reactionary recoil, but something different, something still subversive not co-opted or institutionalized. Spiritual art is not religion, they write, marking off spirituality from institutionalized forms of organized religion, a move that will become increasingly common in the new period. Rather, spirituality is humanity's quest to understand itself and finds its symbology through the clarity and integrity of its artists. Spirituality is placed within the domain of what is felt, that is, aesthetics, art, 
the new locus for spirit reinvented. Indeed, as the manifesto claims, the remodernist job is to bring God back into art, but not as God was before. The idea of God itself is thus reinvented, and invoked by these post-postmoderns to reinfuse art with new depth in the search for individual identity. As they put it, quote, in order to know ourselves, and thereby our true relationship with others. Such aspirations, though, are toward more than simply a change in attitude and ethos. They are linked to actual formal strategies and methods in which this ethos might find proper expression. For the remodernist, then, the means of spiritual reinvigoration of art requires a departure from postmodern methods like deconstructive and conceptual art, and a return to other forms, particularly painting. As they put it in their Stuckist manifesto, art that has to be in a gallery to be art isn't art. And more brazenly, artists who don't paint aren't artists. In short, deconstructive and ironic methods, now co-opted and institutionalized, must be abandoned in favor of something more direct honest and earnest. As they go on to say in their Stuckist manifesto, postmodernism, in its adolescent attempt to ape the clever and witty in modern art, has shown itself to be lost in a cul-de-sac of idiocy. What was once a searching and provocative process, as Dadaism, has given way to trite cleverness for commercial exploitation. The Stuckist calls for an art that is alive with all aspects of human experience, dares to communicate its ideas in primeval pigment, and possibly experiences itself as not at all clever. Again, one hears echoes of David Foster Wallace's anti-rebels here, I think. Such is the remodernism as articulated by Childish and Thompson. And while almost 20 years old at this point, remodernist ideas in the arts are more popular than ever. Tangential to these developments, for instance, one sees a similar move taking place in the contemporaneous formation of the so-called kitsch movement, begun in 1998 by Norwegian painter Odd Nerdrum, and continuing energetically into the present day. Employing the tried-and-true method of embracing a pejorative as one's flag of endearment, Nerdrum, ironically, conceded to the assessments of institutionalized postmodernism that art which did not engage an audience ironically and in a spirit of conceptual deconstruction was not actually real art, but simply sentimental kitsch. As a then-rare defender of the tradition of the old masters, the tradition of painters from the Renaissance to the 19th century, Nerdrum accepted this unfortunate bifurcation as an opportunity, a clarion call for a new movement. Because they wanted to represent the old, untrendy human concerns, they were, they wryly accepted, apparently the painters of kitsch. Over time, the movement has gained a number of young converts. Artists, disillusioned with the landscape of a predictably shocking postmodern art, inspired instead by a different tradition of pre-postmodern painting. Such post-postmodern movements in the arts have continued to grow, such that today we are seeing a full-blown renewal of representative painting, something which had dwindled to general obscurity during the heyday of postmodernism and contemporary art. Some have even adopted the banner of post-contemporary, an explicitly post-postmodern tradition. Artists like Richard T. Scott, Adam Miller, Martin Whitfoot, Patricia Watwood, Graydon Parrish, Carl Dobsky, and others are emerging as prominent figures who eschew postmodern strategies of deconstructing reality in favor of realist and neo-romantic attempts at reconstructing skillfully crafted narratives of self-discovery, renewal, and collective transcendence. In all of these developments, we see a revival of various principles and practices from the modern era, 
and a rejection of postmodern ones. Whether it is appropriate then to extend the term remodernism beyond its narrow origins as an early 21st century art movement in Britain to encompass a broader range of cultural production, that's open to debate. What is clear, in any event, is that the decline of postmodernism and postmodernity has occasioned a revival of forms and ideas typically associated with modernism and modernity. And while simply sticking the prefix re in front of modernism may suggest a simple reactionary gesture, a lack of movement, uh, synthesis, progression, it's also clear that this revival is, at least in many instances, a return with a difference a recapitulation and reworking beyond mere recoil and imitation to something new out of the old. Remodernism was one early and relatively influential attempt to articulate, even instigate, a post-postmodern paradigm. However, despite its still resonant echoes, I think it would be hard to argue that we are indeed now living in a re-modern period. Remodernism may be better seen as a movement, and this is significant, one proposed prescriptively, as an agenda articulated and promoted by particular artists. That's one way to take the culture's temperature. The remaining two paradigms I wish to consider, however, were put forward by cultural theorists and aimed toward descriptions of the contemporary moment, rather than any generative invitation or call to action. These paradigms, performatism and metamodernism, are offered as heuristic historical labels for our current cultural period, the air of postmodernism, and, I think, provide more serious contenders in the periodization debate. To them, we'll turn next.